Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us again this evening. I'm going to start by just doing a quick introduction of myself, uh, Lisa Valerio. I'm the founder of the Phoenixia Foundation, and we provide trainings, workshops, and we also provide diagnostics for families with special needs. And it is our pleasure this evening um, to have both Don Ferreira and uh, Lisa Luna de Curtis with us. Um, and so I'm going to start by doing a little introduction and then let them quickly jump into the presentation so we can take and make the very most of the hour that we have together. I'm also going to put really quickly, I'm gonna go create a little launch poll because um, love for all of you who are on Zoom to actually let us know where do you reside, um, you know, how you're related to somebody with special needs and then how you heard about this webinar. And if you are on Facebook Live, if you wouldn't mind just putting that in the chat, we would greatly appreciate it. So, um, Dawn and Luna are speech language pathologists who have practiced individually for almost 30 years and have collaborated on multiple projects for the past 20 years. They both have private practices in the San Francisco Bay Area and see children in all ages and stages with a focus on early intervention, autism, and social cognitive learning. They are passionate about what they do and enjoy coaching families and professionals to see how small changes can make a big impact. They have presented together locally, statewide, and for their national association, and have written numerous articles focusing on how to maximize the use of technology with children. Dawn and Luna have had the pleasure of working with Phoenixia and myself, which has been incredible for over um, eight years now, doing in-person presentations, and this is our first um, webinar um, together. Um, and they've done this on a variety of different topics, including social language learning, while using mobile technology. They support the work that the Phoenixia Foundation is doing to bring support and education to international communities. So I wanna thank both of them in advance. I'd also just ask that everyone, if you have any questions throughout, if you could put it in the Q&A on the Zoom, and then again in the chat in Facebook. And we're gonna leave the last 10 minutes or so for questions and answers. And any questions that are not answered, we will be putting them um, out um, in the link uh, when, after the, the webinar um, in the next you know, four to five days, or they'll cover it in the next session because this is a two-part um, webinar. So with that, I'll let Luna and Dawn uh, take it away and I'll come back on when, we, when we're ready for Q&A. Thanks everyone. Good morning, everyone in the Philippines. Good evening, everyone in California and on the West Coast, all the way through the East Coast. Welcome to our two-part presentation of addressing speech, language, and learning in a virtual space, challenges and choices. Now, as we come upon a full year of schools closing, I'd like us to just have a year in review. The pandemic of 2020 had us all reeling for different reasons and all taking on different roles. Um, parents became teachers. Teachers felt like students. Commuting parents, particularly commuting dads, were now stay-at-home dads. Working mothers became homeschool logistical coordinators. And even healthcare professionals had to become technology experts. And it was our children who did their best to stay flexible, adaptive, and resilient. And I think the most important part is to remember this was an entire collective shift. We were all going through it together and still are. So although this manifested differently, depending upon where we lived, right? Region to region, whether you lived in rural areas or cities, we all felt it together. And we all made this shift together and became a global community because of it. And now is our time to really look at our new reality, our new challenges, and our choices that we can make around it. So, um, Dawn, do you want to introduce yourself and say hi? Yeah, I just want to say hi, everyone. Um, I meant to say hi while you could see my face. Later, you will see my face again. 
But hello and welcome and thank you so much for joining us and for supporting the Phoenicia Foundation. So while we are gonna be talking about challenges and choices, um, like I said, we have a new reality, right? And as you can see in this picture, sometimes that's our new reality. But there were unexpected benefits really that came from us fumbling through all of, uh, with all the shutting down, right? With the schools, the businesses, the stores, the sports and extracurricular activities all shutting down, it really did offer an opportunity, and I'd like us to reflect on that first, what you might have felt uh, was a benefit during this time. Did this time bring your family closer together while you were sheltering in place or while you were learning from home? Um, did it perhaps help you better understand what your child was learning or how the teachers were teaching it? Um, did it offer you opportunities to maybe take control of your schedule, reprioritize things um, that were more important to you, maybe even uh, become more creative, take on new hobbies, get more sleep? Um, again, while there are so many challenges, we think there were opportunities to develop new teaching skills, model flexibility, and sharpen relationship with technology. So there were also a lot of things to consider. <laughs> and as you can see here, um, you know, these are some of the general logistics that each of us had to deal with when we decided to uh, either work virtually or as we were supporting our family virtually. Personally, I was affected as a professional who used to go into clients' homes or they would come into my home clinic or maybe to work out in the community. And after that, I just went full-time being online. While I also was a parent of two boys, one in elementary school in third grade, one in middle school in seventh grade, and also having my husband home who was used to commute, commuting a two hour round trip, he was now at home as well. So I'm gonna be speaking from both perspectives as a professional who had to now do telepractice and as a parent. Um, Dawn was full-time traveling to clients' homes. Um, every day, she just had a really fascinating schedule of driving all around the Bay Area to her clients' homes, and she went to full-time uh, telepractice. So with her older daughter, who's in grad school, now doing school from home. So again, I think we could all say universally, we had so many interruptions to work with, uh, just in our daily lives on and off, you know, our virtual sessions, so many glitches to work through both with the technology and even maybe glitches in the schedule, double booking, having to be creative of who could go on when, um, the fluctuating attention of all of us, the children and the adults, as well as the distractions. I mean, so many distractions when we were online, from pets and siblings to even when we were offline, um, having to just juggle a lot more. The communication breakdowns when we were online, just trying to get ourselves understood or heard, or if there was a delay or if Wi-Fi, you know, cut out, how did we handle that? And then of course, screen fatigue for sure. I think we could all feel that. So what we do want you thinking about is while you're listening to us, um, what do you want to focus on? We want you to think of either a client or a child, his or her age, and a specific challenge that you've had with virtual learning. What goal did you want to target to improve? And while you're listening, you may want to list out the choices that we discuss to see if some of those are what you want to try. Because at the end of tonight's session, we do want to make sure that you have an option to try during the week so that next Friday night or Saturday morning, when you join us again, we'll be able to discuss um, how things worked out in the areas that you practiced. What, what was challenging, what choices you made, what changes were made and what new challenges came up. So as you see here, 
As far as the challenges that professionals often had to address every single time they logged on, well, one, I think the cartoon does say a lot, but also in looking at the age, the grade level, the child's diagnosis, right? We constantly had to switch gears and get us into that mode. Um, were we going to be just doing an individual session with the child or involving the parents or involving the siblings, right? What would be the communicative obstacles between the client and the parent and the child or um, just being able to communicate in different ways than the child was used to? And of course, the frequency and duration of the session, you know, maybe we'd shoot for an hour, we'd only make it to 45 minutes or a half hour. Or maybe we'd start the session and decide this wasn't going to work and have to reschedule. And then, of course, how are we going to set up those boundaries and expectations? We, as professionals, were figuring those out a lot of times um, in a trial and error way. And then coming back and saying, OK, let's try it differently. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about. How, are we, how did we try it differently? So here you can see. Um, there are so many unknowns for professionals and so many uncontrollable things for parents. Again, as you see in that picture, right? We never knew what our kids were going to come up with. And those challenges were changing on a weekly basis. So even just yesterday, while Dawn and I were working on this presentation, my middle school son came down to um, let me know that he had a math test right now and he needed to print it out. Well, my printer was out of ink. So I needed to change that for him. Uh, my printer also started printing out his work very slowly. So I was taking his test up to him sheet by sheet. But this was while I was working too with Dawn on this presentation. I had to switch to the phone so I could walk through the house while we were working. I had my other son in school. My husband's upstairs working. Um, you know, it's funny. We don't often think to disturb him when he's working, right? So perhaps in your house, there was one person who more readily got called upon to help, uh, you know, children when they were virtually learning than another. Um, but some of the other issues that came up were the acoustics in the house, right? I mean, how loud things were, who was going to be the parent involved in a session, um, what we were going to do when the child's attention really was just on a roller coaster ride. What were the environmental distractions, right? Every home has different ones. And that's something that professionally we had to deal with and that personally I had to make sure we limited in our house. And how about what other screens were on, the TVs, the other, you know, the phones that were making noise, right? So it was a big challenge in terms of balancing a lot at once. Um, I also think, like I mentioned, the ambient noise, the acoustics in our house, we never really considered until four people were trying to actually work all together. You know, the physical fatigue of sitting so long, of staring at a computer, right? You know, we had to all get more comfortable chairs or sit on pillows or get back support, right? We also had to figure out how to take care of pets and siblings and extended family in our home while we were either working or while we were um, trying to help our children in the home um, and also had to really negotiate the devices that were used for learning or play um, and also the amount of time on screens as well as wi-fi issues and in our home because my husband worked in the tech industry we were able to up our wi-fi improve our routers so that all four of us could be on and still, just this morning when I was in an IEP meeting, the Wi-Fi went out. Both my sons weren't able to be in school. I was speaking during the IEP and I lost it. So there was just no way for all of us to do it, even in the best circumstances. And you'll see a picture later that when all four of us had to leave because of the fires in California, and we went to a hotel, it was a small room, and you will see, I mean, it was my husband at the hotel desk in the room while my son was on the bed, my other son was in the bathroom, and I was on the balcony. And this was all of us trying to just be creative and make the most of it, right? That's all we could do. So we now have 
new tradition, uh, traditional goals on this new mobile platform. And even if you look at these pictures, right, kids really trying to make the most of it, but also we had to really be creative in accepting when they were going to um, maybe get stuck in a chair or lie down or just want to get up and leave, right? Um, because even for their bodies, the stress on their bodies with the ergonomics uh, was hard. It still is hard, right? Just as the addictive nature of screens is something we always have to work with, right? No longer could we just limit it and say only two hours on screens for the day. Or no longer could we say you only get the screen after all your work was done. Now it was all integrated. So um, yeah, it just added to the challenge. So it actually reminded me of a challenge when the iPad first came out, right, over a dozen years ago, well, about a dozen years ago, when we were all learning it together. It wasn't like the adults knew it and the kid, we were teaching it to the kids, right? We were all learning it together and it was a steep learning curve and it's similar feeling for me while learning to do telepractice and having my kids do virtual learning. So I'd like to segue to uh, a case study with two of my clients from the same home. And a um, little boy has autism, five years old, and wanted to be able to uh, teach him how to be on the computer because he was only used to me being in his home. And then his sister, I was working with articulation, and we now had to go from me being so close up to her in person in her home to trying to figure out how to do it on screen. And there I am on the balcony with all the noise coming from the pool and the cars passing, um, trying to do some speech therapy. But we're gonna talk about him in particular. I do wanna let you know that with this boy, I had already worked with him for about a year and a half. The mom was always there during our sessions. And he was absolutely resistant when we started. We really started in five minute increments, little by little. He would come up to the screen, look at me and then just scream and leave. And so he really had a big resistance to it. Um, another challenge was he would come and only wanna look at himself in the mirror, only wanna make faces in the mirror. He really didn't wanna engage with me at all. So his mother was always calling him back, um, which was frustrating for him. He would just, again, frequently scream and run off because even when he was there, he didn't quite know what he was expected to do. He didn't really know how to imitate me uh, on the screen. And it wasn't natural for me to just say, you know, ball, say ball. That's not how we had worked. So it was um, really challenging. So our things to consider, I mean, we really had to stop and say, okay, what's the best hour for him? To even give this a try. What's the best hour for mom? She likes her coffee and we decided let's get that in first before we try this. Would he be eating before the session, after the session, during the session? Um, would his sister go first or would she wait? Would they go together? We just we had to try to constantly consider different things to try and the troubleshooting during the session. I would sometimes say, you know what, could you grab a pillow and put it right at his back? You know, it looks like his feet are dangling. Could you get a box under his feet for better attention? Um, you know what, could you give him a little massage? Stand behind him and give him just some deep pressure massage. That would help. Or you know what, how about, let's just try to wrap him in a blanket and bring him back. Just sit him right on your lap and just be there with him. Hum in, hum in his ear, whatever we thought might help at the moment. And of course it changed every time. We said, let him eat during the session. That'll calm him and I will read a book or play a video that I'm gonna be using so he could just take it in receptively, calmly let the food also ground him and then we can try more activities after. Um, we also, every time he left too, I would try to entice him back with a skill that I had. Instead of having the mom call him back constantly, which was frustrating for her, I would say, let him go. Let me entice him by playing music that he liked. Let me play the superheroes uh, theme that he likes and see if that could come back. Let him hear voices on the screen that might get him back. Um, but I also had to constantly tell the mom, it's okay. 
let him go, we will reset and start over, right? Because the idea is we're connected, and then we're not connected. We both need to calm down, our systems down, transition, and then reconnect. But every time we disconnect, I would say to her, it's okay, let's start over, right? That restarting was important. And also using her as the person who would cue him helped. So I got into the habit with him of I would cue mom and mom would help him. Because if we were practicing phrases and I was showing him pictures and I said something like, oh, the dog is running, the dog is running. He would automatically think to say that, but then once mom would say the dog is running, he would know to imitate her. So we just had to use that type of dynamic. And then really, I think the results are important to see where this picture is from a couple of weeks ago where mom texted me and said, here he is sitting in front of the screen waiting for you to start Zoom. He's just staring at the message that says, you know, it'll open momentarily. And he's ready on his own there waiting, has his water next to him and is excited to see my face come on. Um, now this was a child who, when we started, not only would show up for short increments, but one day he showed up and he wasn't using his individual one or two word phrases. He looked and he said, I hate you. <laughs> and so mom was like, oh, and I said, Shh. and I just looked at him and I said, okay, I know, I get it. And he went, and mom wanted to say no. And I said, I looked at him and I just went, mm -hmm. I get it. I know. It's okay. And he went, mm. right? Giving him that permission to say, it's hard. I get it. You don't have to do anything. Just be here with me. And that got us now, 10 months later, to him looking forward to being there in the session. And just yesterday, he was actually able to be there alone. In the morning, the mom said it was a really hard session with the teacher. She wasn't sure how it was going to work out. I had the sister go first. Um, then when I thought he was ready, mom said she wasn't ready. She had some things to do. I said, that's fine. Why don't you take 20 minutes? We'll try again. So I rearranged my schedule a bit. So when we were able to come together, he was eating lunch. We had a great session. And the highlight was when he was done and he asked his mom for more food and she was able to go in the kitchen, separate from him make him food. She would check on him. Just look, he was still attending. I would say about seven or eight minutes. It was really powerful. And it was a testament to, we meet those challenges by making different choices. And for him, I really let him have his emotional breakdowns. That was important. I really addressed his sensory needs on the spot right there with mom. I would entice him back so it would pique his curiosity. He wouldn't be on the defensive because he didn't think he was in trouble. He was curious and interested. I would cue mom more than cueing him to let her be the model. And then really I would just build the capacity for him to stay, stay and connect with me. And every time it didn't work, we would reset. And now I'm gonna let Dawn share some of her case studies. Thank you so much, Luna. I really love that story because it reminds me, the client that I've chosen to talk about, I had a similar situation with him. I chose this client because when everything went virtual, I thought this is gonna be my most challenging client to work with. I'd been working with him since he was three he was basically minimally verbal at that time. He is quite verbal now. However, due to a seizure disorder and medications that he takes to deal with that, he's got a lot of developmental issues. So there's delays in processing, there are difficulties with language expression and comprehension. So I, and the biggest one is attention. So even seeing him in person, we had struggles because I'd see him at home and home was a very wide, big boundary, right? All of his toys were there. He's got three siblings. 
And there's a lot of commotion happening at any given time at his home. So corralling him at home, given his attention issues, was difficult to begin with. So I thought, I'm not sure how this is going to work. How will we do this when I'm not there to provide physical boundaries, verbal boundaries, to um, make adjustments as needed, taking in the environment? How is this going to work? Well, mom and I decided that we're going to go ahead and try it. And we decided that, you know, while she would have to sit with him just to make sure that he was safe and um, to try to get him back on track, that, you know, let's do it for five minutes and see how it goes, right? Um, maybe it'll go 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, maybe an hour, which is what, what I usually saw him twice a week for an hour each. And I made space in my schedule to do that, right? I said, let's be flexible here. So we started off gradually. And he was, if you can see in that first picture on top, you know, like many kids, he was fascinated by watching himself on the screen. So there was a lot of manipulation of the screen, moving the screen, turning the screen off, getting close to the screen, you know, making faces, which I just worked with. I worked with that, right? I did the same thing. I did what he did, right? I put my face close to it. If he would cover the camera, I'd cover the camera, all of that, just to keep him engaged. And similar to Luna, uh, about the third day of doing virtual. And on that first day, we did about 15 minutes or so. And I was really committed to making sure that the time we spent together was going to be very useful for him. Even if we had scheduled an hour, I was like, I'm not just going to be on the screen with him, with um, you know him running away and mom having to run after him and we can get him back on track. I'm willing to say, let's just call it at 15 minutes. That first day was about 15 minutes. Second day, we got to 30 minutes. And on the third day, I was very excited. Like, wow, we're at 30 minutes. This is great. We're probably going to make it to an hour. And I sign on to Zoom, which is the format that I use. Um, and I hear, I hear him. I don't see him. But I hear him off to the side saying, I don't like Dawn. <laughs> and then I hear mom you know, gasp, and then I'll go into that mode of, oh, that's not nice, and thinking about manners, and I'm like, just like Luna, I'm like, mm, wait a minute, I go, let me handle this, right, so I said, oh, I heard you say, I don't like Dawn, now, let's try that again, a little slower, come a little closer to the camera, so that I can see your mouth, now, let's try it with your mouth open a little wider, and you know, I'll, I'll understand you even better because I want to know how you feel. And he's like, I don't like Dawn. He said, okay, now let's say it in a different speaking voice, a little less whiny. Let's try it like this. I don't like Dawn. And he did, he did that. So you can imagine that I worked from that point on and got him to say what he really didn't like because this is a very loving child. And I was confident, of course he likes me, but he doesn't like this situation. And I didn't like this situation either, but I was able to utilize that feeling that he had and create something more. I don't like sitting here. I don't like mom hovering over me. I don't like that I can't watch my favorite shows right now. So I got a ton of language out of him, which was of course an objective. The other challenges with him and his family, now his three siblings were all at home too. And as Luna mentioned, you know, she has two children at home doing school. She's got a husband doing school. She's running her business. You've got all this commotion commotion and ambient noise. And of course, with a child that's easily distracted, can you imagine everyone working on a computer, talking, dad walking around, walking through the living room, which is where we started, dad walking with his headset on in a conference call, you know, not aware that we're having a session here. And this is a child already with difficulties focusing. So there were those challenges. There were also the challenges as we talked 
before and you saw the pictures of, you know, can we have a seating situation that will support his body? He has a little bit of low tone, which means that having the trunk control to support himself sitting up, not slumping over is difficult. Sometimes you have to provide some support. If you see in the second picture, that was actually taken today. He's now on a bar stool in the kitchen and you can see at the very corner that there's a pillow behind him. And even with that support, right? He's still kind of fixing a little bit and leaning against the back of the chair. But, you know, I give him such credit for being able to do this because it's a major, it was always a major challenge for him anyway in terms of seating that would support his attention. And the things that I really had to consider here is, you know, there were days that, um, well, I, I know I certainly felt this way where I felt like I'm not really into looking at this screen anymore. I am so tired of looking at screen. I, I, I would say that that really happened for the first five weeks for me, where after being on the screen for so long, I sort of had headaches. And I could imagine that he was not only doing my sessions, but he was also trying to do uh, school through Zoom, which was enormously difficult as it was in a group of other children. And the other children created such a sensory overload with just visually, auditorily, it, he just, he couldn't do it. So his parents fortunately were able to have me work with him five days a week. And I have to say, although he was the child I was most concerned about, how are we gonna do this virtually? You know, he is the child that made the most progress. He made not only the most progress of comparatively you know, with my other clients, but also in the time I've been working with him for seven years now, this is the most miraculous progress that he's made in that time. Of course, there are other factors to consider. He's 10 now. You know, his brain is maturing somewhat, uh, but uh, he also had to be extremely flexible, which was not necessarily a skill that he practiced too often. So, you know, had we never switched to virtual learning, we may never have had this opportunity to one, increase the frequency of the sessions, two, troubleshoot and, you know, work through it and have him, actually, he really had to stretch his skills and abilities too, because um, it's very, very difficult when the person's not there in front of you. He had to work a little harder. He had to make his speech clearer. So um, just so you know that even if you feel sometimes that whether it's your child or as a practitioner, therapist, teacher, a student that you're working with, you may feel that this isn't gonna work. I don't know how this is gonna work. I will tell you that even the most difficult clients and students, you can see a way through. And here are some of the things that, you know, I want you to consider. These are choices that you can look at using to improve some of your sessions, some of your learning time. Um, as I said, with my client, we had to modify on a daily basis, the length of the session. You know, how long was it gonna be? Um, I will tell you with that client that we, I even, if I didn't have a client right after him and he was doing great, I mean, sometimes we tacked on 15 minutes, right? So we're like 75 minutes into a session, which his mother and I never believed possible. So be flexible either way with the duration. Frequency, as I said, for him, it was super fortunate that in the initially, because school wasn't working out so well, that we were able to increase the frequency. It's not possible for everybody, but if you are able to do that, sometimes it's exactly what helps. You know, Luna talked about the challenges of the environmental distractions, and there are plenty. And I'm sure those of you with us right now have ones that we can't even imagine, right? But we know that there are other people sometimes in the background. There are other screens in the background. There are TVs on sometimes while you're working. There are phones that are ringing. With my client, um, as he got really good at being independent, his mom still or a, a sibling or the dad needed to sit with him just for safety reasons. 
and uh, they would bring their laptops and phones. And sometimes those were huge distractions for me because I would hear the, the clicking and the dinging and then this and that. And then they kind of forget that um, I could hear everything that they were saying. As I said, they'd answer phone calls and that was an enormous distraction, right? So we want to eliminate those distractions. Sometimes you can do that by meeting with the parents before the session starts and let them know what the boundaries are, what conditions you think would be most conducive to their child learning at this time. And don't be afraid to tell them. I mean, they want their child to be successful, right? So we have to let them know because sometimes they're not aware that what they're doing in the background is very distracting. Um, now my client is seen um, in the kitchen. So you can imagine everyone passes through the kitchen. They're washing dishes. I hear the water rushing. They're cooking, you know, all of these things. But he is doing extremely well. I do sometimes have to just say, all right, you know, he's doing well. I may be irritated by this distraction. I'll address it at another time, but he's doing really well. So think about setting boundaries before or even after a session so that it can support this learning environment. It's really important to establish boundaries with the child as well. So I do work with kids, you know, from ages five all the way up to adults. Um, and um, depending on what they're cognitive, co cognitively capable of managing, is set a boundary with them. So I happen to have a whole, you know, bunch of, you know, from nine to 13 year olds and um, they are pretty tech savvy. And a lot of times they will open up different uh, windows in their, on their computer, on their iPads. Um, and they think that I don't see it. However, although I can't see their screen per se, but I can see where their eyes are going and I can hear the clicking of the keyboard. So I establish these boundaries with them. And I say, what I expect of you today is to not open up any windows, not text anybody, not to um, turn off your camera. If I'm sharing something with you and you can't see me and you think I can't see you, to not turn off your camera. So I establish those boundaries up front. And I do with those kids, those school age kids, I will say to them, do you, can you follow that? Can you make that agreement with me today? Honestly, sometimes they can't. And I say, I understand that. So let's build in that time for you to share your screen with me for you to explore as needed. Cause some of them I see at the end of their school day and they've been on Zoom all day. They've been on a screen all day and they kind of want to play, you know? So I'll build that into the session. So they have that outlet. Two more of my clients. Um, one thing that I like to use, again, because of the, the monotony, the boredom, the staring at the screen is, you know, we will dress up. I will wear wigs, I'll wear different costumes. I encourage my clients to do that as long as they aren't a hindrance. Same thing with putting a virtual background on. I'm okay with them using a, a virtual background, but they can only use one and they can't switch in the middle because that's a distraction. Filters as well. Some um, programs have filters so you can put funny hats on and look like animals and things like that. You'll see the bottom picture is my client. You know, he put on a filter so I can only see his eyes basically. And I thought it was hysterically funny. I thought it was great and it wasn't a distraction, but I encourage you to only allow one filter, right? I also um, use a lot of what I call um, picture puppets. I'm gonna give you an example. So to hold one's attention. So. I will print out different characters that I know that my clients are interested in. And those characters join us. Sometimes the, these characters are models. They'll model the target sentence, the target word, or sometimes they will have conversations with my clients. You know, that way my clients don't get quite as bored, you know, with just seeing my face. Sometimes we have, you know, a three-way conversation, um, that sort of thing. Uh, 
And I'll just, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll learn like, what do they like? What kind of things are they interested in? And they really look forward to it. And uh, they talk to them. And even if you don't have a printer, you can cut out pictures from cards, funny pictures. And this is just on a wooden skewer. You can use a popsicle stick, whatever you have available to make these little characters, right? Kind of come to life. Um, I cut out things from boxes of toys. And I will just tell you my little client that I shared with you earlier, um, his mom, while I was working with Luna today said, oh, just wanna let you know, he's now interested in Wreck-It Ralph. So, you know, he might wanna make an appearance. So as I was talking to Luna, I got an image from Google Images. I printed out Wreck-It Ralph and I was cutting it out. And sure enough, Wreck-It Ralph made an appearance and you may have seen that in the earlier slide. Um, so doing these sort of things, you know, really help with the monotony, keep the child interested. I also, um, I do a lot of reading with some of my school-aged kids. So right now I'm using two screens. I've got my phone so you can see me and I've got my iPad where the presentation is. When I share my screen with a student, I, they can't see me, right? Which is unfortunate. I share a lot of books with them so they can look at the text, they can see me reading, um, they read off of my screen, which is really uh, fantastic. Uh, but when I'm reading to them, I let them draw. For a lot of kids, drawing is a very organizing activity and it helps get them centered and focused. It's not really a distraction um, as long as it's not a distraction. I might not do it with a five-year-old, right? Or I might not do it with a client that's really not capable of using the drawing materials as they were intended. As you saw earlier, there was one of my clients that had two markers up his nose. He just, he, he knows how to use them. He was just being funny and that's totally fine. But you know, if the child, child tends to fidget, give them a productive fidget, right? And drawing is a really good one. And I encourage them to draw something that is related to what I'm reading, what we're reading. I start many of the sessions with a feeling scale or a rating scale, uh, especially um, on Zoom. When we first started, I said, you know, how are you feeling today? I know you've been on the screen all day at school from one to 10. What are you, are you feeling tired? Are you feeling energized? Just so that they can kind of identify the feelings, emotions, um, whether or not they're fatigued, you know, that sort of thing. You can do any kind of a scale you know, with them. I call them feelings, but it could also be one just around energy, interest, or a, like I sometimes kids will say, I'm bored. And I love it when they say I'm bored. I just really love that because I engage them in a whole conversation about it. But I'll say, okay, so today on a scale of one to 10, how bored on, are you? You know, and it really launches a great dialogue and conversation. So I encourage you to do that with your students, children, clients. You know, as speech language pathologists, we have goals. We have goals. We want to reach those goals. They're important to our clients. And what we learn, um, not only in a virtual space, but in an in-person space as well, is that we're constantly modifying our goals. And I would say virtually even more so. It doesn't mean that you abandon those goals, but you modify them to fit the situation. And with my lovely client here, you know, we, I had this goal. We're working on storytelling. We're going to work on narratives today. Well, as you can see, his hair is wet. He had just been swimming. He was, it was a good thing for him because sometimes doing an activity like that before you're going to sit down and focus is great. You know, it gets your body ready. He happened to be a bit tired, you know, and he also was hungry from swimming and thirsty. Um, so I always allow snacks unless again, the snack becomes a huge distraction, right? So in this case to get him ready, because, you know, I really appreciate the parent's 
getting the kids there on time, being ready. But him just having been swimming, he really wasn't ready. He needed something to drink. So of course, letting him drink. He loves this cartoon, the PJ Masks, which I know everything about right now. So you can quiz me about it. I can sing the theme song. I can make the voices. I can do a lot now, thanks to him. But I, uh, so I let him watch a small clip and on Facebook, you can find a small one to two minute clip of just about anything, right? And I feel that these are really important breaks for them, right? It is a video break, right? You get to look at this. What I will often do, even if it's a two minute little clip, I will pause it and I'll ask a question about it, right? Because of course I'm gonna keep on working a little bit, right? So I will ask questions about it and, um, you know, try to engage, right? I'm always trying to engage. Uh, Luna uses uh, boom cards, which I don't use too often. It is another resource. We do have that listed on our resource page. Um, and this is, these are really great. They're made by professionals, teachers. Uh, some are free. They are, they cover a wide range of areas, language, articulation, cognition, you know, all ages, this is a good resource. And again, um, you don't necessarily have to pay for it. You can, but they're pretty reasonably priced. So that is an app that she likes to use a lot. I love using apps, right? Love them. I've ever since they came out, you know, that was my thing using the apps, right? So now I'm gonna share with you briefly two apps that I like to use. I have breathing and meditation. now. All of us kind of need that, you know, to get ourselves calm, ready, organized. I just used it today with one of my clients. So right now, what I'm going to do is show you this one app. It's called Breathe. It's a Sesame Street app. And I think it's valuable for us to kind of go through one little cycle of it. So you can see, there it is. Challenges. Hola. Mando from Sesame Street here. Our monster friend is having a tough time. He needs your help. So now you have the opportunity to choose. Okay, well, what, is, what does he need help with? Okay. Today, <laughs> my client chose this. Hmm, this monster is frowning and his shoulders are scrunched up. It looks like he's having a really hard time waiting to go down the slide. He's feeling impatient. Tap on the monster's belly to help him put his so hands on I'm it. So as I'm tapping, I'm breathing, his belly. modeling the breathing with my client. Look, the monster Sometimes is I'll have them down. put their hands on their bellies, or I'll let them tap the screen as yes. well. He looks much calmer. Awesome. You help the monster breathe slowly and calm down. Now... He's ready to think about ways to be patient. That while made he me waits. feel better just now, just Pop so the you bubbles know. To tell the monster helpful things. So then and think of some plans. I will tap on these bubbles. Think, think. And think. this is also teaching them. Keep thinking of a plan. To wait. You're almost there. Be patient. Uh -huh. To think you about the, the next to move. Think of a plan. Sing a the song while he provided. waits. Then we think again. And I'm modeling breathing as Think well. Think of a plan. Keep thinking. You've almost got a plan. So we're planning. <laughs> Look, the monster has an idea. Count the things around him. One more. Put on your thinking cap. Think a little bit more. You've almost thought of a plan. <gasps> you helped the monster to think of a plan. Ask a grown-up, like his mommy, to dance with him while he waits. Let's listen again to the plans the so monster repeats, thought of to solve his problem. Is important. Sing a song while he waits to pass the time. Count the things around him to take his mind off waiting. Ask a grown-up, like his mommy, to dance with him while he waits. To choose a plan, So we make the choice. It. The monster is singing a fun song to help him wait. The monster was impatient because he was having a hard time waiting in line for the slide. And you helped him feel better. 
Now the monster looks like he's having fun. When you feel impatient, breathe, think. So what's and really do. important again? Both it tells you slow. breathe, think, and do. Breathe, think, and do. Right? And I tell you, this is to me an invaluable app. I I use it so often and I just feel better right now. I don't know if you guys are doing it along with me, but I'm feeling pretty good. Anyway, I do have another app that I want to show, but I see that I'm running a little bit long. So what I would do is perhaps show you on part two, right? Because there's just one more thing that I, I want to talk about is that with any session, you know, as therapists, we always sort of have a framework in mind how to set up that session, especially if it's somebody new. And although today we're not going to talk about what each of these mean, but just so you know that these are the things that we think about. We think about who are we working with? You know, who are we working with? What grade are they in? What's their cognitive level? What are the cultural considerations that we need to be aware of? What's the purpose? Is it going to be a child focused situation? Is it going to be child and parent focused? Is it going to be just a parent coaching situation um, and plan, right? We always have a plan, but you have to be flexible within that plan. I'm not going to read all of these again, because I want to get to a challenge that Luna has for you all. Luna? Hi. Okay. So now I'm going to be talking about work that you can do during the week by using this form. You can choose an area that is challenging that you're facing as a professional or as a parent. You can make a choice based on one of the ones that we mentioned or something else you thought about while watching the progress that you noted when you made that challenge and even a stumbling block that might have gotten in your way, okay? And then thinking about what will you try next? So this is one way that you can be um, working on overcoming those challenges with different choices. Then I also want you to try with the child, from the child's view, what ch challenge is the child facing? Is it boredom? Is it attention? Is it um, behavior? What choice can your child make to change that? What progress might you note during the week as you help your child make that different choice? And then what stumbling block might get in the way of that? And what can you try next? This reflection exercise is one that you could bring back next week so we can talk about those as we talk about the eight Ps and as we look at more apps, and that's what we'll be doing, sharing new choices, discussing more techniques, answering popular questions. I see that some of you wrote your questions down for us, and we'll certainly be able to address them and even propose future webinar topics. As you'll see, Dawn did list her recommended apps that she really enjoys using, um, as well as references that you can turn to um, on your own time and look in terms of um, where to get different materials online, the boom cards that she mentioned, um, the YouTube channels that are out there. So we hope you enjoyed it this evening or this morning for you. And uh, we look forward to answering some questions now and look forward to discussing the eight, pre eight P's framework next time. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thanks both uh, Luna and Dawn. Um, we do have some questions, and I also just wanted to remind everybody who registered that there is a link that you all received um, prior to this presentation of the actual um, little homework that uh, Luna just went over with each of you. So there is a Word doc that uh, there was a link that you should be able to get on Google Docs. So um, just wanted to remind everybody of that, and we will also send it out um, in the um, replay of this. We will be sending out an email to everybody with the link to this presentation so you can go back on our YouTube channel, but it does always live on our Facebook channel. So um, just wanted to cover that so that everybody knew. Um, one of the questions that came up is, can we ask parents to give verbal prompts when our students are asked questions 
or we let or wait for the students themselves to answer or not. I'm not sure if my question is clear, but I hope you know what I mean. I think you know what they mean, but I wanted I to- I can speak to that for sure. Um, I do cue the parent a lot to help the child, okay? Now, if I were going to do maybe a test on Zoom or virtually, and the test question says, you're not allowed to cue, then I would just ask the question and let the child answer or not. But even then, even if I marked the child by saying the child didn't get any credit for it, I would still then cue the parent and say, now you ask him or you change the words and I'll make a notation about his or her performance. So yes, I would encourage you when you're doing virtual learning to use the adult and cue the adult to help that adult cue the child. And I just want to add, I mean, that's a great question. And as I mentioned before, that, you know, you have that conversation with parents either before the session or after the session. And that's one of the things that you would talk about. My client that I showed you, he has a delay in processing what he hears. And so when there is that space and that quiet, a natural inclination for everyone is to repeat the information, right? But I know my client very well, and I know that he's processing, he's thinking, and it can be seven to 10 seconds or even longer before he can get a response. And the adult that is there with him will often jump right in and repeat the question. And what that does is that causes him to kind of start again he has to process that now another request, right? Or more information, even if it's the same information, it can delay his response. So I think that, you know, if you know your student well, let the parent know this is how you can be most helpful, okay? And as the teacher, as the therapist, you take the lead, right? And you let the people know, I will cue you to cue him or her. Yeah. Um, the other one here is it's really difficult to handle special children um, or those with special needs, especially during these, these trying times in which classes are being held online. How do you motivate parents to enroll their special needs children? Mm -hmm. Yep, I saw that. And I, I also want to tack on somebody else asking for those children, maybe if they have a meltdown during the session or maybe if they don't wanna listen, right? How are we dealing with behaviors? And I think that's one of the reasons why many parents wouldn't wanna enroll their children for the online classes. They're worried about behaviors coming up. And I think it is important to empower professionals to say, it is okay to work with that a little at a time, small increments, meaning, you can just start, even if the child is screaming, you can start by even modeling calm behavior, okay? Mm -hmm. You can start by just not talking a lot, just mm -hmm. letting the child see you and seeing a smiley face. And then maybe just all of a sudden, right? doing something that's simple, okay? And I think if as professionals, we stay calm, it'll help the parents stay calm. And that goes to answering the question for parents who don't want to enroll because they're afraid their child won't, won't behave. You let them know that's natural and expected and the professionals can help. Keep it simple, keep it quiet, keep it engaging and just make that connection with your smile. As Luna said, you know, um you got to modify your expectations, right? And to have the child be present, even if the child is upside down in a chair under the table, you know, you can have the screen on and, you know, who knows, like, boom, up comes a little puppet that they like, right? And just them engaging, looking at the screen, remember that that's progress. That is progress. We can't have everything perfect to begin, perfectly seated perfect attention, that sort of thing, but just engagement to some degree. We are at time. 
And I want to thank everyone who's asked questions. And again, we will address questions that um, we may not address or that was not addressed already in the um, presentation. And we look forward to seeing all of you next Friday evening or Saturday morning. And I do want to apologize for those of you who are on Facebook Live and those of you who registered and we ran out of slots. I will increase our Zoom account. Um, for next week so that more people can um, join us on Zoom. But again, we um, do go live on Facebook and you can join us there and be, you know, we've got people monitoring the chat there too. So um, I will definitely increase um, our participation for next week. And I look forward to seeing all of you then. Thanks again, Luna. Thank you, everyone. So Thank you. It. Be Take safe. Care. Have a good day and good evening. See Bye -bye. you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.